So, it's a pleasure to be here. Very nice to see so many people have come here to listen to this presentation. And it also makes me a bit nervous because this is sort of jumping into the lion's den and presenting things about sustainability and food production at SLU, which is a stronghold for competence in that field, of course. Uh, so, uh, but this is, a, as, a, as was told, uh, multidisciplinary, you could say, in some respect, project. Uh, it's three year long and it ends in a few weeks. So we're in the very final stage of the project. So uh, it's a very simple project, really. The starting point, the, the basic th question is quite simple. It's very pragmatic. It's about, we know a lot about how to make food production systems more environmentally sustainable, I should delimit it to that. It's not about social sustainability or, or so, it's uh, environmental. We know a lot. Why don't we put everything together into functioning supply chains and see how far that will take us in reducing environmental impact? That's a simple question. It's quite basic. It's not uh, all that new, perhaps, but there are a lot of things you have to take into account. I mean, first of all, it's a complex system. It's not an easy project. It's an easy question. Uh, but also, if you try to de design or discuss new food production systems, uh, there are a lot of constraints on product safety, of course. You can't risk to, to uh, have a s uh, worse product safety, and it's about product quality. Uh, no one will, will introduce systems that will, will mean lower product quality because no one will eat the food, and then we don't have a sustainable food production system. So, uh, and also animal health and welfare. And also we have these consumers that complicate things. Uh, I mean, for, for, the, for the business, for industry and agriculture, it's really important to try to, to consider how consumers might react to changes that we introduce in, in our systems. So that's basic question and a lot of uh, constraints on that. Uh, well, back to the presentation. I mean, this is a project that is uh, jointly funded by, by Vinova and uh, the branch organizations along the food supply chain. Uh, Farmers Fa Federation of Swedish Farmers, the Swedish Food Federation, the Swedish Retail Federation, and also the region of Västra Götaland, where SRK, where I work, is located, and also SLU in Skara has a quite big role in this project, so they decided to go in and fund this project. We also have a reference group, I won't go into details. But this is the background, the basic question. And today, I would like to discuss in this with this audience, with this group, uh, it would be interesting to discuss the approach, how we have gone about this quite complex question still. I mean, sustainable food production, that's, uh, that's a big question. And we have developed, or the West, we have developed an approach, a met method to make this opera <laughs> operationable, I think it's in English. Uh, and also, uh, perhaps, of course, we can discuss the results. I will present uh, results from these studies as well. But the approach is, I think it's important because trying to grasp two big questions often leads to that you get mentally blocked. You just discuss and discuss and discuss and never become real concrete, I would say. So uh, and we have tried to be really, really uh, close to the ground. And what we did, we, all we started actually with to define three what we can call goal, goal visions or s goal scenarios. I think like they are called goal scenarios in later slides, which is basically a grouping of goals. What do you want to achieve? What environmental aspects are most important? Because if you look at all kinds of environmental aspects, there will be severe conflicts between these goals. And then you get the gridlock and you, don't you can't get further. I would say that the discussion on, on uh, in the media lately on e ecological versus conventional was stuck on this uh, differing goals. Uh, that's really the main uh, main thing for that discussion, I would say. And we defined three. I will go back to that. Three uh, combination of uh, environmental goals that we called ecosystem, plant nutrient, and climate. I will come back more to that later. And then we co designed three very concrete, I would say production system, supply chain, from, from fork to farm. Uh, not, uh, not to fork, actually, to retail, I must... Um, uh, into really big detail, how should this production system look? Uh, agriculture, processing, transport, packaging, logistics, and so on. 
And uh, so we quantified and described in detail. And then we uh, did environmental impact assessment with life cycle assessment, which is my background. Uh, for these six, we call them staple products. You can read it's about it's dr uh, bread, drinking milk, cheese, sirloin steak, smoked ham, and frozen chicken fillets. That's the products we were looking at. But we also looked at the corresponding share of the agriculture in the region of Västra Götaland, looking at all the pro uh, primary production, not only the, the steak, but the whole cow, so to speak. So it ha had a different scope on, on these two different levels. And we also quantify the production costs for primary production for agriculture, not the whole supply chain, because that's, well, we realized quite uh, early already in the application phase that that would be too complicated because, uh, and also about how we did the environmental impact assessment. Agriculture is a complex system. It's really complicated, but it, not, it doesn't really produce so many products. The farmer produces the pig. The meat industry produces 200 products. You can't follow 200 products all the way to the retail because that would be extremely large data-wise. So you need to f follow the, the whole flow of raw materials un until industry, and then we choose a few products to follow the all the way through uh, to also include the, the rest of the supply chain, not only agriculture. Uh, and also we, we have these consequences that needs to be taken into account. And another way of looking at it, this is perhaps not the most clear picture, but we started with we're having these production experts, colleagues from SLU, for example, and JTI and SIK, uh, identified promising solutions. This is a starting point. We know a lot. We know how we can reduce emissions, reduce energy use, and et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And then we, in the second phase, we coordinated this. I mean, you have some solutions that is really promising for crop production. You have other solutions that is seems quite promising for, for dairy or, or pig production, but they need to be combined, and you have the manure system. Everything is connected. So you need to, to, to coordinate these parts of the system, these subsystems, into slightly fewer possible solutions, and also take into account already here at least some of the limitations imposed by this you shouldn't have negative consequences of the changes you, s you s uh, suggest. And then we designed improved supply chains from farm to retail, and one per product and each of these goal scenarios. So in all 18 supply chains, in theory, it's not really that in practice. And then we uh, you d evaluated these using life cycle assessment and cost and also the other consequences, product safety and so on. So this is how we went about. We started very broadly and then narrowed it down using a lot of constraints. We, we uh, delimited our, our the space of possible solutions by having quite strict uh, constraints on the system. And that's actually part of this way of this approach. Because if you have all, all levels of freedom, you will have this gridlock. You just you never reach a solution. You will always discuss this and this and that. So I this is actually way of working, you have to delimit yourself to become more, more uh, hands-on. So, and uh, it's about mainly three competence areas. We have this, my part, which is systems analysis, on mainly life cycle assessment. And we were, SIK was also the project leader. And then we had the, the production experts uh, from SIK, JTR, and S SLU. And then the consequences was also, uh, so when we, really work together. This is actually, I would say, a truly uh, collab collaborative project. We have had regular meetings. I mean, I have people in the room that have been, uh, once a week we had short telephone meetings and interacted quite a lot, even though it could have been much more. In retrospect, that's one of the learnings from the project. You we should perhaps have made that even more intense to, to reach more interesting uh, systems and results. I perhaps should m mention that I forgot that in the beginning. I have a background at this university. Well, I'm still uh, have some kind of connection. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Food Science at SLU, and I have a PhD from from this uh, university in agricultural engineering. So I don't know how I really happened here. Uh, I mean, agricultural engineering and talking about this, but still, that's my background, and that's quite useful because you need to communicate between these areas. 
communication is important and you have a broad understanding of the whole system. I've been at SIK, which is basically food industrial research, food science and so on. So I learned a lot on in 15 years. So I think I was in a good position to, to actually, well, I didn't, did, didn't do it myself, but my, my uh, contribution was, uh, I think, uh, communication has been important. Actually, it took me 20 years since I took my, exam, my, my degree as an agricultural engineer till I finally had the opportunity to quantify and describe machines in, in uh, grain production. It took 20 years. <laughs> doing a lot of other, th other things between. But now I finally had the opportunity to talk about tractors and, and harrows and so on. So, and uh, the scope of this project, it's, uh, we have this production system, it's very simplified, but you have the agriculture, processing, distribution, and then the, the retail. And the another constraint, we didn't go into the discussion of increased or decreased production. We, had a, we need to put a, a constraint on, we will deliver, our new systems will deliver the same amounts as this region, Västergötalands land, did in 2012, deliver to industry. That was sort of the, uh, the basic. And, uh, and then, of course, this system needs a lot of inputs and it creates outflows, not only emissions, but also crops that are uh, in surplus and plant nutrients in, in manure and byproducts and so on. Uh, some scenarios, we also have energy and materials delivered from the system. And what we, this is what is included in our quantifications, the environmental part, the LCA. So we included every, everything in this. This is the part where we actually introduced new technical solutions or management solutions, production solutions. So it's a, we didn't go into how energy was produced or, or fertilizers or so on. So this is the, the, the limitation. We did, however, in one part of the project, look at different ways of taking care of the byproducts. We had uh, anaerobic digestion for byproducts, we have incineration, we have different ways of dealing with these byproducts coming from this system. So, And this, back again to these uh, goal scenarios or goal visions, where we have uh, the, the center here, you see that simplified way of describing this. For this scenario, we had it focused or we prioritize these environmental impact categories, which is very much trying to focus on to reduce impact from local ecosystems and also to maintain and strengthen ecosystems, the biodiversity and so on. It's a very broad and, and not very well defined area. But in LCA language, it's about the three first is very much LCA. And the fourth is we decided to introduce the area of natural grassland as one. We should maximize that because that's the best proxy we had for biodiversity in, in uh, agri the agricultural system as such. And we call it, in the slides coming, we call it ecosystem. It's broader than just ecosystem. And then we have the second scenario on plant nutrient use and uh, reduce eutrophication. And also, once again, you have the environmental impact categories in focus and the name. And then the third scenario was on reduced greenhouse effect and energy use, more technical things we can call it, where we try to find systems that as much as possible reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases, whereas in the other we try to find solution that as much as possible reduce eutrophication and acidi acidification, for example. And there are overlaps. There are a lot of solutions that fits in all of these, all the, with all these three goals, but we try to keep them as different as possible to see where, what does the differences depend on. Uh, so the results I will show you, I, I will say it again, but I'll start already now, is not three ready-made scenarios. Please pick one and go for that. It's, it's a platform for discussions and then can of course combine solutions from different scenarios into a sort of a, a better scenario. This is a, a uh, decision support, I would ca call it, rather than a final result. We have been quantifying the environmental part in two uh, different levels. We have one is the, we call it the product system, where we follow the product all the way to the retail, the six products I mentioned, uh, where we use quite straightforward life cycle assessment, even though you don't know it, it's, it's uh, quite straightforward. Uh, we allocated things. We didn't take so much of the system into account. Whereas the other, sorry, whereas the other uh, approach was the 
looking at the Västra Götaland, the region, the system, the whole agricultural part of this project where we looked at, at uh, we, we took into account this uh, byproduct management, we took into account uh, connections to the energy systems in a more thorough way, so we could int include also questions about resource use, bio biological resource use in a larger scope. And, uh, and these two approaches obviously uh, answers different questions. Today I will talk mo mostly about the, the upper one, the product system, and that's uh, several reasons. One is that it's easier to explain. Uh, the second is that we have proceeded more, well, we have, uh, we have uh, ha the time to analyze the results in more detail, so I feel more confident, even though the results are still preliminary. Hey, it's two weeks to Christmas, we still have got a lot of time. So, um, so, but I will show you some examples of results. Back to the scope, these two approaches, I would like to be very clear what I mean. The product system, that includes the supply chain all the way to the retail, and we follow these six products, whereas the regional system is only primary production, and actually we call it primary processing, slaughter, milling, some milk treatment before it's before the flow is split up in all these products. So we follow it as long as we can follow the complete flow uh, in one reasonably not one, but it's few few flows. So it's uh, a carcass weight for for animals, for example. It's not a live animal that is delivered from the farm. It's the carcass weight out of the slaughterhouse uh, and so on. And it's the the wheat flour for the the. the the wheat, wheat system, the bread wheat system. Perhaps, well, I think I should, we, one of the, the issues, one of the solutions is to have a better integration between production system, which is not really the case in today's agriculture. I mean, it's, it's very much what you, you, should, you should be able to, to produce different feeds on all farms, which facilitates better crop rotations and better manure management instead of having very separate production systems. And I think that's a critical approach when looking at the whole agricultural system. You, could, you couldn't, my colleagues have said when we had too much to do in, in November trying to generate results, why did you need to include all products? We should have taken one or two. But it, it, shouldn't, it wouldn't have worked because the, the main thing is that you can integrate between production system. That, I mean, a lot of the solutions we think is found in that. So we, we define that kind of hypothetical internal market where these flows between farms, both manure and, and uh, feed, was managed in a way. And then we had, an, we call it an external market. We still import things. It's not in Albania or, or uh, North Korea. We have a lot of flows in and out of, of Västra Götaland. So we also have take into account soy that comes in and we export things and so on. So we need to quantify that in, in this way. I will not read this in detail. It's I wanted to show what we have done. This is a uh, simplified still, but it's a kind of summary of what changes, how we have changed the plant production, the crop production uh, in, the in this project, where you have the four scenarios, and then you have different aspects. Uh, it's about manure quite a lot. It's about how, how incorporation, spreading, what time of spreading. It's about if you have any manure treatment, and then doses, and then crop rotations is of course important because that's a critical thing in today's agriculture that we have two poor crop rotations. So we, and this is I haven't done this. It's colleagues at uh, the Department of Soil and Environment. Was it what you call what you call yourself in English? <laughs> that's correct. Close enough. Uh, so we this is what I want to show with this picture. Really, is we did it in detail. We try to go into the production system, how it works, in, uh, and, and uh, identify uh, concrete changes. And we had more. We have also had on, on looked at precision farming and technical me measures. Uh, we also had uh, in the third scenario, we actually assumed that we used only biofuels and fossil fossil fuel elec electricity. We introduced cooling instead of drying, for example. And we also I need to mention the last one because that's important that we change the inflow on nitrogen fertilizers. On the post farm, what's happened when the bread the, the wheat is harvested, we, we introduced we quantified improvements on wastage in the supply chain from eight to four percent. 
uh, we are rec reason to believe that you can save 15% of energy in the processing phase. Uh, this is the bread, not the, the meal, this is bread. And also, as I said, we had uh, on, on uh, energy, the energy system, we assume some changes. So, and the reason that we have all scenarios here is that when, when the product leaves the farm, there's not so much trouble with conflicts because you can't really, well, you can do tiny things to improve biodiversity in processing, but that's, it's limited. Uh, when, it, when it leaves the farm, it's more about reducing wastage, saving energy, being more efficient. You don't have those conflicts between, between uh, environmental goals. So we had basically one, one solution for, for all these goal scenarios for the post-farm chain. And this is how the results, this is for bread. This is the product bread followed all the way to retail gate. We have not included the retail as such. We have included the reduced wastage. And what you can see here, this is global warming potential. I mean, cli uh, that's climate change and per kilogram of bread. And you see we have a reduction. We introduced some changes, not so. But in this scenario, we haven't really focused on reducing the climate impact, the scenario one focused on other things. Here we have focused on, on uh, plant nutrients, which is connected to greenhouse gas emissions. Nitrogen is one of the most important drivers for, for greenhouse gas emissions. And in this scenario that we really try to find practical solutions that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we have reduced it with like 30% per unit bread, uh, which is, I think is quite good. I mean, you have like 10% reduction in without really focusing on greenhouse gases. And the reason, well, the causes to greenhouse gas emissions is mentioned there. It's very much about, not really much about, not so much about fossil energy, but it's about nitrogen fertilizers. It's about methane from manure, because this wheat is not produced only on the uh, arable farms. It's also from other farm types, chicken or, or uh, pig production farms. And of course, th these are preliminary results and uh, there are uncertainties, methodological uncertainties in quantifying, ex for example, nitrous oxides from soil. I think that's quite well known, but this is the best estimates we can get. Then we dug into these results and tried to understand why can we reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions with one third. And then we split it up in, we can use, just by ch changing the fertilizer used in the bread, the bread wheat production, you can reduce it by 10%. And then the green one is, we cool, we have this, uh, we take away the oil-fired drain dryers and rep replace them with cooling, which is tested by JTI in, in, in uh, trials, seems to work quite well. So that saves a lot of fossil fuels, actually. And then you have the less nitrogen running, uh, going around in the system, means you have reduced nitrous oxide emissions. And then... Uh, uh, this is the bakery itself. I mean, here actually SIK did something because we have, did we have done quite a lot of work with energy reduction in the bakery industry. And you can use different combinations of technology to, to use much less energy in baking. So it's not only about agriculture. And then, of course, the wastage. 4% reduced wastage and delivering the same amount means that you need to produce 4% less at the beginning. Or you can sell 4% more depending on how you see it. So and that shows up clearly in these results. Pig production, uh, we looked very much at uh, production efficiency. I can say that already now, actually, because imposing these constraints, we had one important constraint on, on production costs. That was the, the new systems that we designed shouldn't mean increased production cost for agriculture. We only looked at the cost side, not the income side. So we didn't take into account added values for different production types, just looking at the production cost, which meant that we quite soon realized this is about intensification. We can't in in introduce a lot of changes and having uh, lower production efficiency. So it's actually a result of the constraint rather than a preset idea of what is more sustainable. And that comes back to what I said in the, in the beginning about introducing constraints helps you in the work, even though it delimits your freedom of, of thinking, but it also makes it 
it makes pushes you forward in in uh, def defining designing new systems. So all all the th all three scenarios were actually about intensification quite a lot. And at the pig production system, we collaborated with a. And another SLU department, uh, and we had this production data. We reduced mortality. We had a lower mo recruitment rate for the sows. Uh, we had a higher meat percentage in the carcass, and we had le less feed use, higher feed efficiency. And uh, that's uh, in these data, we realized when we tried to quantify these improvements. Of course, you have some trials you can you can you can lean on, but we actually ended up very much in all production systems that it's reasonable to assume that if we take the best quartile, what is going on today in agriculture, this is the sw basically the Swedish average, the reference column, and these are basically the best 10 to 20 percent of pig producers today. And then we, okay, that should be reasonable since producers reach those levels today. So that's the where we decided to put the quantification. And then, of course, we have reason, we have explanations on what is needed to get there. It's not just that we have, okay, they can do it, everyone, everybody can do it. We have also uh, described what is needed. It's very much about, in this case, it's about djurerga. What's that in English? Oh, never mind. Uh, it's about professional uh, animal handlers and so on. So it's, and it's also about management, it's about production management and measurement and being professional in all steps. And never mind, and then we also looked into the feed rations, different, uh, different mainly the protein part of the feed ration was changed from today's soy based to rapeseed based and rapeseed and soy with a more rapeseed and then the finally we had a based mainly on faba beans, which of course had an implication for the possibilities in the crop rotations. So it's the combination between crop production research and animal research here, I think was it was a good interaction and iterations that uh, turned out in these feed rations and crop rotations. We also looked into man different manure systems and, and uh, how to store the manure. Manure is important when it comes to environmental impact. Post farm, is, uh, which is processing, we used uh, less energy, and this is based on real data for from a large, large uh, meat processing company that we had worked with previously at SIK in a project. So we could use data from there. Uh, that was a, a, a reasonable reduction with not. I mean, that's that's possible to reach quite soon. We looked also on wastage. Uh, this is sliced ham. Where you have uh, today, uh, the wastage is about five and a half percent, and we could reduce that by better technology and better meat quality. And also, we had uh, another packaging, which partly led to less transport needs. So we added these things up in the in the ham supply chain. And here you can see this is once again. I'm, I'm a bit. I'm a bit. Um, I don't really like only presenting this about global warming potential, the greenhouse gas effects, but. It's easier. T most people have a relation to that. I will have. I have some other results as well. But this is this is dramatic. I was when I saw this first. I mean, you could actually re uh, half the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of ham at the retail. I haven't seen any results like that in literature. So of course we we thought this must this must be wrong. Someone has made a mistake in entering all this data because we have huge Excel files with agricultural data and processing data and packaging data and everything is connected. So it's, but then we, 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 we dug down and actually we, we, now I believe these results and I think this is, this is exciting. This is what makes uh, life as a food and environment researcher uh, like a, a good life. And these are again the three scenarios. Uh, and this is on product at retail gate, as I s retail gate, as I said. And what you can see is that the main difference is in feed, and that's the production cost, environmental cost for producing all the feed that the pigs pig is eating. And then, of course, we have improvements on manure management. We introduce, we have acidified the manure. We have only slurry. We have uh, uh, what more did we, did we introduce? covered lagoons and so on. We did everything we knew about manure management and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. And then we also had smaller 
uh, improvements on, on later stages in, in packaging and weight and so on. So if you do the same an analysis for pig production as we did for bread, you can see that, that the first, this is sort of, the, oh well I didn't say that on bread, but I, I'm sure you understand. This is the, the sort of result you just, I just showed you, and the, the difference is it's mainly to reduced feed. Having this higher production efficiency, more piglets from per sow, lower recruitment. Lower recruitment means less uh, the animals <laughs> standing and eating and not, not producing. Uh, we had uh, higher protein, uh, sorry, higher feed conversion. And if you add everything up, it means that per kilogram of pork you need 17% 17, 17 less feed. And that goes directly into reduced environmental impact for the pork. Because you need to grow less feed. Or you can grow the same amount of feed and produce more pigs. But if you divide it, it doesn't make any difference. It's the same result here. Uh, we also had on the last slide, we had a uh, partly we looked at the result for, for grain production, which was much more efficient. We used all this technology and all this knowledge to reduce the green greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram. First, you reduce the amount to 17%, and then the impact per kilo with 40% more, more. That adds up quite a lot. And then we add, uh, we add on some that we actually have uh, less less protein feeds, we introduce more synthetic amino acids in these systems, which means that you can have a more, you can push down the nitrogen level in the feed with maintained uh, production. You don't overfeed with proteins. So we have more grain and less protein feed. And then of course we can, in we have some uh, processing waste and also we had uh, some minor things, but I, I think that this makes sense actually. So as I said in the beginning, this is a very e simple project and it's the solution is very simple. It's just about getting everybody involved in this complex supply chain to do the right thing all the time, everywhere. That's it's as simple as that. Which means it's not very simple. But it's this is a sort of a, th how far can we get? That was the main question. And I think this, this explains. If we really, really did everything, we do everything we already know, we could reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from our pork consumption, as long as we eat Swedish pork, of course. Uh, this is, I have perhaps I should have shown you a picture of what environmental impact categories we include. I've only talked about uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but this is on eutrophication uh, with, once again, LCA lingo. It's uh, marine, that's a nit nitrogen limited recipient. Uh, we, we have this, so it's mainly driven by nitrates, this. And here you can see a significant decrease, close to 50% reduction per kilogram of pork. Uh, not per farm or per, per area, but per production, uh, unit of production. And this is, of this is uh, basically a nit nitrate leaching issue, so it's about feed the feed production. But we also looked, this is not, an, this is not LCA lingo, this is uh, just, we have, we have quantified the hectare doses per hectare and year for the whole region. This is all production systems. No, sorry, excuse me, I'm confusing. These are the th three farms, uh, th the hypothetical farms, pig, chicken, and, well, arable farms, which uses most pesticides in these systems. Dairy production and, and uh, beef production is less intense in when it comes to pesticides. And in if you recall this second scenario, the well, the first solution scenario, the ecosystem approach, where we have introduced mechanical weeding, we have, uh, have mechanical weeding and we have uh, crop rotations that uh, we have more tillage in general, so we reduce the need for pesticides. It's not an organic scenario at all, but it's about trying to, to make take the best from the organic production system and but still allow pesticides to keep the production uh, levels up. We may more or less half half the, the dependency on pesticides. And this is, of course, th these are uh, theoretical solutions, but we have discussed with the uh, uh, extension services and the Board of Agricultural Experts and so on. So we have actually tried to look, try to have practical experience in, in these are reasonable reductions. And uh, these are very preliminary, I must say. We, we have found some er errors in those, but I think it it's, uh, shows that the 
the, the reduction of greenhouse gases comes with a price when it comes to pesticide use. That could be the conclusion in a short-term perspective. It's, this is, as I said, it was what we already know implies that these solutions should be possible to implement in a five to ten years period. Land use is, of course, important for several reasons. One is that land is a scarce resource, you can say, which means that if you use less land to produce, uh, produce the same amount, you can, you can s use the spare land for other purposes, contributing to an introduction of, a, say, bioeconomy, the new buzzword, or producing more food to feed the world. Uh, we talk about food security. So this is a bit not very clear picture, but you see the scenarios. The reference today situation, these three solution scenarios, and then you have different. You have this is in Swedish. I oh, I missed to translate. Sorry. We have divided the region in in the the plain areas and the more uh, broken mm, production landscape. I don't know what is in English. Uh, so we have uh, plain areas, and this is Mellanbygd, which is uh, how do you say that in English? Any suggestion? I'm, I'm at agricultural university. <laughs> oh, sorry for joking. But w what's important here is we had one, opti uh, one parameter that was very important for this ecosystem scenario, and that was to, to use uh, natural grasslands for, produ for production of, of food. And this is the, the use of, of these pastures. And you see that today we use about close to 60,000 hectares, but if we design system that is based on, on grazing bee, uh, cattle instead of indoor feeding and so on. We, we can actually use close to the double acreage of this. And this is an important goal for the local, the regional authorities for many reasons, biodiversity, landscape, uh, tourist reasons and so on. So that, that's an important aspect. And once again, the, if you want to save on climate, it costs when it comes to biodiversity. Uh, this is just to show you the other type of results when we look at the whole agricultural system. This is not per kilogram of ham, this is per kilogram of or ton. No, this is not per anything, this is per, sorry, this is for the region uh, where you can see the different scenarios. The scenarios are the same, but we, I can see it there. Uh, and you it's, it's about pig production and you have the different impact, uh, impacting parts of the system. But here we have introduced different ways of taking care of byproducts. So uh, in this scenario, for example, we, uh, we uh, use anaerobic digestion for a lot of the manure and the byproducts, and then we replace some fossil fuels. So this is what is called complementary system. That is when the food production system delivers more than food, and then you can s use these resources to, to uh, make savings in other systems. That would be an hour, this, I think it would take an hour more to uh, explain this in detail, but I hope that you can see that there are differences in focus on this, and uh, they, they address different questions. So, before going to the next, uh, next uh, part of this presentation, we also looked at one of the constraints was the production costs for agriculture, and we worked together with Carly Vakum at uh, SLU in Skara, and uh, he has quantified the production cost using the same uh, input data as we did for the environmental assessment. So it should, there are some, it doesn't really, f not completely same yet, but we try to, to do that uh, as we speak here. And the, qu the conclusion was, uh, well, the aim was to assess if the scenarios incurred increased cost. We this is not an economic analysis of the production system. It's about, it's a constraint. We're, we're sort of not allowed to increase the costs to reduce the environmental impact because then we could have invented anything. The sky was should be the limit for what we could do to reduce the environmental impact. But we had imposed this constraint on ourselves. And the reason is, well, what we have suggested doesn't really uh, mean increased costs which of course goes hand in hand with the increased production efficiency, higher yields, less feed per, per pig, and so on and so on. So it's not a big surprise, but it actually 
all the scenarios for, for most of the production system has a lower production cost, despite the fact that we introduce in scenario ecosystem, we had two and a half percent of the acreage is not uh, used. It's an extensification, which is the cost for that is carried by the production system. Uh, and we have also have uh, green manure in the crop rotation in this system. We have uh, bi uh, biogas, lay for biogas in scenario three, which is not a good business today. But the production system, we can actually m manage that within the system. I'm not saying that the farmer should take the cost, but from a system's perspective, it's possible to decrease the production cost to, to fit these environmental improvements into that system. But of course, there are problems with low producer prices, but that's, a sec that's another question. That's not part of our project. Uh, so it's not that uh, they're making a lot of money. That's obvious. And also, to implement all these scenarios, to impl implement these changes, it's not really an easy task. It's very much about investments, not so much economical, even though there are quite some economic investments, but main much more in competence in being more professional throughout the supply chain in all stages, in all places. And also, as I said, it also means continued structu structural changes, larger farms or more collaboration, uh, more call it, you could call it industrial, even though I don't like the term agriculture. So there's a, co there's a, there's a backside of this coin as well. It doesn't come easy and it doesn't, it will, it will mean uh, changes in how the system looks. Finally, these consequences, which I think is very, I think it's been really, really interesting working with microbiologists, sensory scientists, consumer scientists, and trying to get their input. And as I showed in one of my first slides, we try to have an iterative process throughout the project. We didn't succeed as much as we would have liked. So these consequences were not really that much involved in the design of the scenarios. It that was more a matter of production and environment knowledge behind that. But we did some. We uh, ruled out some, some uh, possible solutions because they would probably have a negative consequence in one of these areas. And it's, it's, it's about, this is my experience from working very close to, for 15 years at SIK, we worked very close to in many projects with the food industry mainly. That's our main, main contact uh, in, the, in the business part of society. And it's, not, it's no use suggesting things that might, have fa that they might mean that you have a risk of consumer reaction, product safety. It's not, they don't even discuss if you don't take this into account. So I think this is really important that we have keep, a, keep an eye on that, keep track of what will happen to these consequences if we uh, suggest changes. And also for a project like this, I mean, it's a big project, three year and like 25 persons and six different uh, partners. <coughs> and we are very hands on. So it's very much a matter of credibility. I mean, yes, we have thought about problems that might occur if we introduced this feed. We, had, uh, have, we have had some experts looking at that. I can tell you it makes a difference when you present this to, to the to, to agriculture or food industry or retail. So I think this is uh, important, but not it's not a big part of the project, but it was very important. And the areas we looked at, oh, sorry, too much. We had basically four different consequence areas, you can call them. It's about, I've already mentioned them all, I think, and uh, I have some, some of my colleagues working with this, this in this, not in the room, but in the, in the seminar at, at l anyway, so. So this is what, what we did, and what we did was, uh, we, they did, I, I was just coordinating. They have presented a general overview of their consequence areas, if you're a microbiologist, and for pig production, sort of a school book text. What is important for, for microbiological f food safety? And the next is, is there any specific aspects of importance when it comes to beef or pig or chicken production? And then they have made the qualitative assessment of the scenarios we, we uh, suggest. You recall these tables of different data for the production. They are backed up by descriptions of how we reach that. 
and then they have read that and based on their expertise they have made a short statement um, so uh, and also we of course these areas are very different in 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 how concrete it can be and the task became different from what was actually planned in the application the project plan because we had envisioned more larger bigger differences in production system it turned out to be quite much as it is today because of the constraints we have imposed <laughs> so we sort of ended up doing not so radical changes and also we couldn't it wasn't possible to have as detailed description of the post form the processing and the distribution because as i said earlier it's it's not a complex system internally but it's a complex system in the the breadth breadth of the the number of different products that you need to consider and take into account and also it's uh, it's fewer production units they're not that keen on on letting us in i mean there are not too many dairies in sweden or too many large slaughterhouses or chicken chicken slaughterhouses are big so that's more sensitive data to get from from the post farm chain but I think this has been a really, really interesting part of the project and, and I think it we have actually showed how the importance of taking this broad approach, not taking the optimization of system first and then you can look at the consequences. I mean, the, the interaction is really, really important here. So this is how it might look. And for, for example, for sensory quality, uh, the things we have proposed, uh, it's, it doesn't it will not it will probably not uh, impose any negative consequences on the sensory quality what you feel when you eat it it might have possible uh, uh, possible pr posi uh, positive consequences because we have it's about meat quality it's about um, uh, what say what, what was it? i think it was a fatty acid composition or something like that because we had other feeds thank you <laughs> And on product safety, they had some sort of remarks that, okay, we introduce cooling of grain. That's not really tested. Keep track of that if you introduce that. That's sort of a remark for, for anyone interested. Could be more molds. And on animal health and welfare, we take away this deep litter bedding for the sows, which might work, but you need to do it thoroughly in order not to, to uh, have a worse animal health and welfare. You can fix it, but you need to do it thoroughly. And consumer trust, yes, it's about how animal, when it comes to animal systems, the consumer trust is very much about animal welfare. So this is examples, of course, they have written more and more in more detail, but so you understand the level of detail for these assessments. So, well, as we have found, the cost scenarios does not seem to cause negative consequences. On the contrary, in several aspects, we have uh, very positive consequences beef production for example we have uh, i showed this picture on um, land use where i had this grassland use was very very much higher in scenario ecosystem and that's a result of having steers is it not bulls steers yes uh, which can graze instead of uh, being indoor fed which means that you have steers instead of bulls that have better meat quality so this it interacts the goal of having a lot of grazing grazing land interacts with the with the sensory signs for example uh, there are issues need to be considered and um, conclusion is it's important to integrate these assessments early in the process and uh, we have not done this as good as you could we have learned a lot we have tried it's the first attempt as i understand it uh, internationally as well uh, so i think we have we are much better place now to understand what this is about Three minutes left, and I have the conclusions. Fantastic. It's, it's always exciting to see where you end up. No, the general conclusions so far, we have a lot of analysis to work to do, especially on dairy and meat production, which is much more complicated. You should stop eating ruminants. They are so complicated to quantify the systems. Uh, no, sorry, but um, there are large potentials for environmental improvements by just applying what we already know. I think that's a that's con that conclusion will stay. But it, 
will require investments and not the least in competence and collaborations, new ways of working in the food supply chain, not the agriculture and not the industry or the retail, but the food supply chain. Reducing wastage needs to be done in a food chain perspective. Uh, producing qualities, that means that you can make more efficient processing and product deliveries to find the, uh, the connections throughout the supply chain. Today it's really lousy. I learned from people working with the food processing industry, the only connection they have with the, the pig production is the price on pork number two. No communication about whatsoever about quality. What do you want to produce in your, your, uh, in your meat industry? That's not connected to what the farmer produces in terms of meat quality. So I think there's so much to do in just starting to collaborate more along the supply chain. Uh, I said that once, I think, only, but these are not ready-made solutions. So I think this is a really useful platforms for discussion. We already have discussions with the S Federation of Swedish Farmers and the S Fed Food Industry Federation, where I, me and colleagues are having discussions and presentations, and they want to see how can you take this further. This is a platform. You have it, this is like a smorgasbord where you can pick things, you can discuss, you can see what's important. Perhaps we should not focus on this issue because it's too costly and it gives so not so much return in, in the sustainability and so on. The scenarios are optimistic, as I said. This is not uh, easy. Every it's, it's like telling all football players, well, it's just to be like Zlatan, you know. <laughs> it doesn't happen. I mean, you need to put in a lot of practice to do that. And finally, I already said that including consequences is really valuable for, for my kind of researchers working with systems analysis and environmental improvements. You need to do that. And the next steps, yes, we will use the results, disseminate, doing here today. We will uh, discuss with the regional authorities. We are talking about finding to improve the extension services to agriculture through the region and through SLU in Skara, which has this uh, extension service uh, center, I think it's called. Uh, and also we, we will also, but the second part is to use this approach, perhaps, if it's useful. The data, we have an extremely large, well not extremely, but very large database on, on agricultural production in this region, which is very much, not totally, but it's quite a good example of Swedish agriculture. Västergötaland is you have most of you don't have Skåne, but otherwise it's you can you can transfer it to other areas, and also the networks. I mean, the, the, the many of these collaborations were new to me. I mean, I haven't met all the people. I mean, we have found new ways of working together, and I think that's extremely important to to initiate new research and new projects and trying to take on new challenges. And this is just some ideas we have had a longer time frame. We had just very very well known, well, well, I wouldn't say well known, but known solutions that we was allowed longer time frame to include radical changes. Should we put on some other constraints? I mean, now we were quite delimited in what we were allowed to do since we had these constraints on costs and product safety and etc. and consumer and so on. Would it be interesting to broaden that or would it be interesting to include social constraints in a more in the definition of, of solutions. Should we look into changes in consumption, which is a very hot issue in the debate. We should eat less meat and we should eat more of that and less of that and so on. The connection to, to, to public health could be interesting to have, have such an approach and look into. And then also very practical thing, it would be very interesting to sort of validate our results by looking at, looking at these best farms that we have used as a template for, for data quantification. That would be, interest, would be interesting. So we have a lot of ideas that we try, hope we can continue with. And this is just uh, the departments involved in the project and the institutes and also the names. You don't read, need to read them, but these are the co-authors on, on a paper we are preparing at the moment. And also, of course, additional colleagues. We, we have more people who have been working with this. So. That's a web, we have a website, uh, which I think is very useful and where we will publish results as, as they are published uh, in, in reports and so on. We plan, we plan, we will publish the final reports in January. 
uh, one is there will be a lot of pages if you don't have anything to do. I think there will be like one report per production system, I mean pig, uh, chicken and so on and so on, and also uh, resu result reports. So there will be seven reports published on this website. In uh, so, uh, and it will be actually historical reports because I think they will be the last ones ever in SIK report series because SIK will cease to exist. Uh, at New Year's Eve, we will become a part of this SP, the Technical Research Institute of Sweden, uh, and be called SP Food and Bioscience. So I have my new email address if you want to contact me. I think it works already. So we will have the same office and labs and organization, but we will be called SP instead. So by that, I thank you and open up for the idea is that if, I mean, now you can leave, it's an hour, so please feel free. So we can take a minute to let the people that really needs to go now. And then we can have some open discussion or questions here before we take the group discussions. So, thank you.